like to welcome you to the Mount Carmel Church to our morning online worship service. Just so thankful that you are watching and listening this morning. As we come to this morning, I'd just like to invite you, if you do not have a church family, to, to come and to be part of the Mount Carmel Church. Our services are Sunday morning in our church building. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock is our morning worship service. We have a children's ministry uh, that takes place during that time also from ages nursery age um, through the fifth grade. So we would invite you to come out. And on Sunday evenings we have our evening service at 6 o'clock. We're looking at uh, grace for a purpose-driven life. And why in the world are we here? What, what's our purpose in life? And we're looking at that in our, our study in the, in the building and in our fellowship hall. Uh, the children or the teenagers have Youth 412. So we would encourage anyone that knows of a teenager or maybe a teenager in your family to come out to that on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. Then midweek, we have our midweek Bible study at 7 o'clock in our church building. Uh, where we have a, a time of singing, uh, looking at your work, looking at God's word, and then a time of prayer. So we would invite you to come. If you don't have a church family that you're part of, we would love to have you come and be part of the, the Mount Carmel Church. If you'd like to would like to know more about the Mount Carmel Church, our phone number is 814-277-4435 and leave a message. And I would be glad to, to get back to you to answer any questions you may have. But we're glad that you are with us this morning. A couple upcoming things that uh, we just needed to re want to remind everybody of. Next Sunday, we're having a baptism service in the morning, followed by our uh, harvest dinner, which is immediately following our morning worship service. And we would invite you to come out uh, to our baptism service on Sunday morning. And at 10 o'clock, and then followed by our harvest dinner uh, here at the church building. So we would love to have you come and be part of that. Those are just some upcoming things. Also, um, on the 13th, we have our Man Up for All Men, ages 18 years of age and up. And uh, it's a time where we meet at 8 o'clock in the morning, have a time of looking at God's Word, and a time of prayer, and then... Uh, usually lasts about an hour, hour and a half, and then we're about our day. But it's a great time for men to come together and just rejoice at, at what has been done for each and every one of them and for each and every one of us. We want to thank you for coming or being part of our church service this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the time that we can come and to worship you and dear lord i pray for those that are watching and listening this morning that you would guide in their lives i pray for at the same time as we have our service in the church building dear lord that you would guide and direct and we pray that there would be open hearts for what you would have for us we thank you for this day dear lord and we just as we look at the times of the year the seasons of the year we just praise you for each and every season that we have and each and everything that is going on in our lives. And dear Lord, how that we need to be looking to you for guidance. And dear Lord, as we look at this comeback season, I pray that we are challenged as Christians, as Christ followers, to, to strengthen again our spiritual lives. We know that much takes place in our lives, dear Lord, and we just ask for your guidance and direction. We pray for our service this morning. We pray for those watching and listening, dear Lord, wherever they may be, that this would be a morning that would glorify you in all that is done and said. And as we look at a, another person within your word, dear Lord, that was, as I call them, the comeback season, where we see somebody that, that struggled with some things in their life, but how that when they turned their life over to you, how strong and strengthened they were by allowing you to work in their lives. We pray, dear Lord, that we would all be like that because we've all been in situations where things have been tough. But we pray for our service this morning. We thank you for this, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, as we uh, come to a time of 
of prayer and a time in our lives uh, we want to start off with a, a memory verse. First Chronicles chapter 16 verse 34. So if we'd all say this together, we'll be saying this through the month of November. First Chronicles 16:34. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. How important that is in our lives to realize that and to give thanks to Him for all that we have, all the provisions that He's made in our lives. But to give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. 1 Chronicles 16.34 We also like to start our, our morning service off with a, a song, and today is one that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. It's entitled, Standing on the Promises. So, Encourage that person that is watching or listening with you to uh, sing along with you, and uh, we'll just sing this to the Lord, praising God that we can stand on the promises that He has made to each and every one of us. So let's sing out this morning, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King That is a great song for us to think about, how that we can stand firm. And I pray that you are standing firm on those promises that we find throughout God's Word. 
that is for each and every one of us as Christ followers, that we can stand firm and that that promise, those promises that he gives to us will be there and, and are there through eternity and how important that is. This morning we want to look at our series again, The Comeback Season. And uh, this morning I've entitled our, our message, The Man Who Tried. So if you turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, we'll be looking at several passages of Scripture this morning, but we want to start with Mark chapter 14, verses 66 through 72. <clears throat> Mark chapter 14, verses 66. 66 through 72. You know, as we think this morning, I, I would like us to, to think for the next little bit because there's a famous poem that's named Footprints. And that, and that poem is a poem that you can find on, on posters, you can find it on paintings, and even small cards that, that many times people have it in their Bibles. And it has a powerful message of hope and comfort. And it goes like this. One night I, I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord across the dark, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. And I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you that you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered. Leave me. He whispered, My precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never ever during your trials and testing. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Boy, that's a very comforting poem for us to think about, isn't it? The idea that Jesus walks beside us every step of our lives is something that, that none of us should ever forget. But there's another view of this idea that, that I find kind of interesting. It's that idea of where you see one set of footprints is where I carried you. And that long groove in where I, where I drug you, kicking and screaming, that long maybe line in the sand alongside with that one set of footprints is us being dragged and and kicking and screaming because God wants us in a certain direction and we have decided to go maybe another way. He is there with us. I believe a lot of our lives can resemble that canon. Well, as we read about Peter this morning, he seems to be one of those guys that Jesus had to occasionally kind of drag along or drag him kicking and screaming because God wanted him to go in a certain direction. You see, Peter was a hard-headed person. He liked being in charge. He liked being in control. Anyone relate to Peter? And may, probably many of you are sitting there are saying, well, that, that sounds just like me. Well, in fact, at one point, Jesus had to rebuke him, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. Because Peter tried to take control of Jesus' ministry. And if you have your Bibles or, or an app on your phone or tablet this morning, I'd like you to be in, in Mark chapter 14. And I'll be reading verses 66 through 72. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 66. And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I, I know not, neither understand. I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. And a maid saw him again and began to say to them, 
that stood by, this is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after that, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and, not, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. In other words, it, he was definitely a Galilean, and they could hear it. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And the second time the cock crew, and Peter called to, to mind the words that Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. You know, the more we, we look at Peter, the more we think this guy must have been kind of hard to be around at times. He may even be like if we can think in our own minds of that person that we shy away from when we see them because we don't want to go over and talk to them or we don't want to go over and see them. It's not right, but, but maybe he's like that person. But then the more Jesus looked at Peter, the more valuable Peter became because Jesus would often take people like Peter, who the rest of the world would reject, and Jesus would turn them into a powerful tool to help change the world and to spread the gospel. In my studying this week, I found how important Peter was. I, I had to remember that whenever the twelve disciples are named in Scripture, Peter's name is always first. Even more important than being named first, Peter was part of a, a very select group of men who were almost always with Jesus. We many times would hear Peter, James, and John. In fact, we find in, in different passages of Scripture, Mark chapter 5, verse 37. If you turn there, Mark chapter 5, verse 37. I want to read just a couple of these passages of Scripture, but Mark chapter 5 and verse 37. Starting back in verse 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead, why troublest thou the master any further? And as soon as Jesus heard the words that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the, the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. When Jesus raised a little girl from the dead, he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. As we just read in Mark chapter 5. Well, we also see that when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1, we see that. And when Jesus was struggling in prayer at Gethsemane, he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. We see that in Mark chapter 14, verse 33, where it says this, and they came to a place, starting in verse 32, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy, and saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And even among those three, Peter stood out. Peter was the only one who walked on water. Peter was the only one who proclaimed, and if you remember this, he proclaimed this, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter was the only one who Jesus gave a, a special name to, or a nickname to, Simon the Rock. Wherever Peter was, you could count on him being a leader that was willing to be a worker for Christ. In fact, at the last Passover, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, turn there, Matthew chapter 26, we want to, to look at this passage, but Matthew chapter 26, we'll be looking at verses 31 through 35. 
Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 through 35. It says, Then say Jesus, Jesus unto them, and that's starting in verse 31 of Matthew chapter 26, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am arisen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Whenever Peter spoke, he often spoke for all the rest of the twelve. They looked to him as a leader, and whatever he said, they would often say kind of these words, Me too. And Peter loved Jesus so much that he believed that he would even die for him. So what happened? How did Peter go from being the man who said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, to being the man who said, No, I, I don't even know that man. You know, how could Peter do that? This rock of a man who loved Christ. How could he turn so quickly and say without hesitation, I don't know this man of whom you speak. How could Peter do that? Well, I believe there's a couple of reasons. There's a couple of reasons that I can think of, and the first one is this. Peter was a controlling kind of guy. When Jesus told his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the, and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised, Peter took him aside and even began to rebuke Jesus, saying in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 and 22, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Think about that for a minute. Peter rebuked Jesus. But this was in keeping with Peter's controlling mindset or the way that Peter wanted to control things around him. And when Jesus was arrested, we're told that Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. We read that in John chapter 18 and verse 10. Then it even says that once Jesus was arrested... Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. We read that on in John chapter 18 and verse 15. Well, what was Peter doing following Jesus into the palace? Why would he do that? Well, Jesus had just been arrested, and he'd been taken by force into the palace, into the enemy camp, and, and there's a strong possibility Jesus will be even imprisoned and even murdered or killed that very night. Well, as I was thinking about that, why did he go to the palace? This is the pastor's thinking, and he's kind of thinking out loud. So if you'd allow me to think out loud for just a minute, the reason Peter followed Jesus into the palace was that he could have, a, a, have had a, a lot of guilt. A lot of guilt that, that was built up in him, and... Was he maybe intending to possibly rescue Jesus? Well, if we think of that, if that is true, why did Peter deny that he knew Jesus those three times? Well, if he hadn't, he'd have given himself away and people would have known who he was and the element of surprise would have been lost. And so would Jesus. Jesus would be lost. So Peter lied and he cursed so that no one would mistake him for a follower of Christ. And once again, Peter thought that he could control the situation. He could control Jesus. He believed Jesus was in danger. And if Peter didn't act quickly, the world would be changed forever. If that's true, why did he do it? Well, too often as we see this and we apply this to our lives, you know, too often Christians are just like Peter. They try to control the situation or control Jesus. You know, sometimes Christians believe 
or they think that their goals are the best or their way is the best way. How many times in our lives do we try to be just like Peter and control the situation at hand without allowing God to, to lead and to guide? Maybe you've been involved in a situation this week where you've tried to guide it along yourself or thought that you had a better idea. But boy, as a Christ follower, we should be allowing God to work and to, to move in our lives and allow Him to work in those situations in our lives and not be controlling. We see here that Peter wanted to follow through with his own goals. Do you know what would have happened if Christ wouldn't have been crucified on the cross? Well, Jesus would have been spared the humiliation and the assault of the crowds. He would have been spared the whip and the crown of thorns. He would have been spared the cross and its horror. All because Peter thought he knew what was best. But if Peter had been successful, none of us would have been happy with the results. Because if Peter had been successful, you and I would still be dead in our sins. You and I would still be under judgment. You and I would still be condemned to hell. Because only the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Please turn with me to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And I, I want to read just a couple of verses here in 1 John chapter 1. But looking at, at verse 5, or verse 5, reading down through verse 7. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. There is no other way. And the only way that blood was shed for us was through the cross, being that perfect sacrifice for each and every one of us, that unblemished lamb. That was done on the cross for each and every one of us. I want to just pause for a moment and say, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, He sent His Son, Jesus, to die on that cross, to shed His blood for each and every one of us. And by simply going to Him and asking forgiveness of your sins, realizing what was done on the cross, and asking Him to come into your life and into your soul into your heart because you know that you are a sinner. We are all sinners and come short of the glory of God. But by what was done on the cross, we can have that assurance of knowing Him as our personal Savior, that we will spend eternity with Him. All of us are going to spend eternity somewhere, whether it be in heaven or in hell. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? So we see Peter trying to take things in his own hands. We also see a second reason that I believe is very true. There's a second reason I believe that Peter denied Jesus. Have you ever heard the old saying, the devil made me do it? Many people use that as an excuse. When something happens in their life, they'll say, well, the devil made me do it. I believe we could say Satan influenced Peter to deny Christ. You know, Jesus told Peter of that in Luke chapter 22. If you turn to Luke chapter 22, we'll be looking at verse 31. Luke 22, verse 31. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted... Strengthen thy brother. Well, you may be asking the question, do you mean to tell me that Peter didn't have a choice? That he was forced to deny Jesus? Well, I'm not saying that at all. You see, Satan can't force us to do anything because we have that within us to make the choice to follow Christ in our lives or follow what Christ would have us to do or to follow the world. 
but I want us to realize that He can influence us if we allow Him to have a foothold in our lives. When that door in our lives is open, that He can get His foot in that. Peter believed he knew better than Jesus what had to be done, and that was the only nail that Satan needed to take control of Peter. Peter's arrogance was the nail that Satan used to influence Peter to deny Christ. You know, we've got to be careful that we don't allow Satan to have a nail in our lives. And you may ask, well, what, what are some nails in our lives that, that Satan can get a foothold in or, or show us some things that, that cause us to go in a wrong direction? Well, as we think of that, some nails in our lives can be things such as pride. It can be selfishness. It can be anger. It can be lust. It can be the love of money, the desire to have our own way or to, to seek control all the time. Really, if you name the sin, Satan has a nail for it. Don't let him have it. As we're thinking today of Peter, I, I just want to talk about one last thing as we think of the life of Peter. Like I said earlier, the more we look at Peter, the more difficult he seems. When we first look at him, he doesn't seem to be a promising, dependable leader. In fact, none of the disciples at first seemed that impressive. Except for one of them, one of the disciples, and that disciple was Judas. We can see prior to him denying Christ that Judas must have been a, a, a likable guy. Because he was trusted with something very important to the disciples. He was entrusted with the money. And that's why the disciples had no problem having Judas hold the money. They trusted him. Well, as we read through, of course, we learn later that he was a thief. And that he could be bought. So can I ask the question this morning, what is Judas known for? Judas is known as the betrayer. He betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Something for us to think about is this. Didn't Peter betray Jesus too? Didn't Peter deny Jesus three times? In fact, they both betrayed Christ. But Judas became the villain of the story. And Judas goes off in shame and he hangs himself. But Peter becomes the hero of the story. Peter steps up and becomes a major leader in the early church and even becomes a, a powerful speaker. Well, they both sinned a similar terrible sin, but Peter was forgiven and Judas wasn't. Why, why is that? Why did that turn out to be that way? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 gives us the answer to this question. If you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, we read this in 2 Corinthians 7 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You know, the primary reason is this, Judas was sorry. He felt bad for what he had did, but never repented for what he did. He felt bad about doing it, or maybe thought maybe he shouldn't do it, but never repented for it. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 3 says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. And you may say, well, as we read that passage in, in Matthew chapter 27, and we'll be reading verses 3 through verse 5, as we read that, we see where it says, repented himself. But the word here, repented himself, in the Greek is a word different than the Greek word for repenting or repenting of salvation. This word means to just regret or to feel sorry. Verse 4 goes on to saying, Saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. Well, the Greek word used here, I have sinned, is not a word used for a true confession of faith. And the leader said, What is that of, to us? They refused to take the money back. 
In verse 5 of Matthew chapter 27, we read, And he cast down, or he threw them down, the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed, and went and hanged himself. We see the story of Judas where he felt bad that he did it, but he was angry about it. He was angry, and he threw it down, and he didn't repent of what he had done. He didn't change his ways. So we see that Judas was sorry, but he really didn't want to change. And the reason he didn't want to change was that he didn't really love Jesus. He realized that he had done wrong, and he couldn't live with the guilt. But his shame was worldly sorrow. He was just sorry. By contrast, we see that Peter wanted to repent of his sin. Peter loved Jesus so much that the very idea of offending Christ caused him shame. Peter's shame was godly sorrow or repentance. And what lay at the heart of Peter's repentance? He gave up trying to be in control. He had failed so miserably doing it his way that he no longer looked at his strength and wisdom and insight to bring him salvation. He looked only to Jesus Christ because he knew Jesus had forgiven his sin. John chapter 21. Please turn there. John chapter 21. We've had you look at many passages of Scripture this morning. But John chapter 21 verses 15 through verse 19 says this, starting in, in uh, verse 15 of John chapter 21. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again, The second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. You know, we all have a story to tell. We just looked at the story of Peter. But we all have a story to tell. But are we living in worldly sorrow? That regret like Judas had, or are we living in godly sorrow, repentance, and wanting to walk with Christ like Peter? I want us to close this morning's service with a video that helps us all to look at the stories we have in our lives, because we all have a story. What is your story like? Let's look at this video this morning. Our stories are a collection of moments, tucked away deep inside our hearts and minds. Moments from the past. For some of us, what happened in the past can limit our present or cloud the future. We hear a voice from within, a voice that says, you are damaged goods. You are disqualified, weak. What this world sees as broken Jesus sees as beautiful. Where culture sees defeat, Jesus sees potential. What society labels as rejected, Jesus offers redemption. The Bible tells us that Jesus uses the weak to shame the strong, and the foolish to shame the wise. When we're at our weakest, that's the very place we can tap into the strength of God. It's in this new perspective that we realize our past doesn't have to define us any longer because we are the community of those who couldn't make the cut. 
the gathering of those not good enough. So may your grief bring about His goodness. May your pain bring out trust in His promises. The past that brought us shame can find renewal in one name, Jesus. As we looked at this video, what is your story? Where are you right now? You know, Peter went through a lot where he tried to control himself, control those around him, control situations in his life, control Jesus. But it came to that point in Peter's life where he had to decide and realize that he couldn't do that. To walk with God, you need to allow Him to have your life. You need Him to have control of your life. You know, we're not saved because we're righteous people. We are saved because we gave up trying to run our lives our way. We're saved because we gave up being in control and gave our control over to Jesus. We are saved because we decided to believe in Jesus as the Son of God and to believe that He had sinned, that we had sinned and could never pay the price for our guilt. We are saved because we decided to make Jesus the Lord of our lives and become a new creation in Christ. Are you a new creation in Christ? Do you know Him as your Savior? This morning we see the man who tried to control things around him. The comeback season. Peter got to a low in his life where he denied Christ, but we see how that he bounced back became a great leader in the church, a great disciple going out and, and going into the countryside, preaching and teaching. The great comeback season, the man who tried. Let's close in a word of prayer. For Jeremy, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our time together. We pray, dear Lord, as we looked at this passage of Scripture and many passages of Scripture about the life of Peter, how that he was a man that wanted to control things, a person that wanted to control things in his life, and dear Lord, how that he failed miserably when that took place. He, he denied Christ three times, but how that we saw that once he hit a low in his life, once he realized that he couldn't do it on his own, where he couldn't control things on his own. That he had to give his life entirely to Christ. I, I pray, dear Lord, that that took place in his life as we saw and that would take place in our lives. That we would realize that we can't do it on our own because we all have a story. We all get in that, that area in our lives where we kind of get down because we live this way or we live that way and God would never use us. Well, God can use us in great ways if we allow Him to have control of our lives. I pray, dear Lord, today for that Christian that may be struggling with something in their life, that they need to give it to You. I pray that they would give it to You, dear Lord, not just saying it, but following through with it. And be like Peter, allowing You to have control of their life. Allowing You to to be first in their life and taking control over what you would have for them and what you would want them to do in the direction you would want them to go. I also pray for that person that does not know you as their Savior today, that today would be the day that they would ask forgiveness of their sins, knowing that we are all sinners and have come short of the glory of God, asking forgiveness of their sin and asking you to come into their life to be their Lord and Savior. Dear Lord, I pray if someone has a, a question concerning that, that they would feel free to call the church. Dear Lord, I would love to talk to them. But dear Lord, we all have been there where we've tried to control God in our lives. Control Jesus in our lives. By not changing our lives, but trying to change Him to us. We pray today for... The remaining part of this day, we pray that we were challenged this morning, but encouraged 
that you are with us each and every step of the way. We thank you for all that you do for us and how you continue to guide us each and every day if we allow you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you for watching and listening today. And uh, we just want to say if you have any questions, please feel free to call the church, 814-277-4435. We just want to thank each and every one of you for watching and listening today. And may God bless.